father was a neurosurgeon, so I'm sure that had an influence in my becoming a neurosurgeon. Although when I was growing up, uh, my mother always wanted to be an ophthalmologist or a dermatologist because of less time constraints. I was long interested in neurosurgery, uh, probably uh, since the days that I was in middle school. Then my interest was uh, furthered by interacting with uh, all the great neurosurgical attendings on campus at Stanford. My father's best friend was a physician. And in those years, as physicians would be surgeons as well as there were no specialties then. And so that was always sort of a role model. And I remember in residency, I started off by going to England. We would spend four to six months studying at Queen Square Institute of Neurology in London. And Dr. Robert Dodd and Paul Jackson were the chief residents at the time when I was a medical student rotating at Stanford and approached Dr. Dodd and I said, hey, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, you know, I'm only two weeks here, but my grandmother's really sick and she's probably going to have passed away. And I remember he just like looked at me and was like, yeah, no question, you should go um, and come back when you're, when you're back. So that was one of my first memories and it lasted. It made a lasting impression on me that this was the right place to go and I'm, among the other people that I met who were kind but also competent and I really appreciated that combination. So um, Sam and Justin were my chiefs. I still really enjoy seeing them at meetings where we can because they don't live in the same geographic region anymore. Um, and then my co-resident was Paul, who, as I'm sure you know, and most people know him now through his book, which is When Breath Becomes Air. So he was my co-resident. And we were, at the end, joined by Rob, who finished a year early and ended up doing a pediatric fellowship during that time. So it was mostly just Paul and me for the majority of residency, and then um, Rob finished up his chief year with us. Um, I also uh, trained at the same time that uh, Paul Kalanithi came through. And so uh, when his book came out and it became really such um, a sensation and I would see it out at airports, at bookshops, everywhere I went in other countries, my parents read it in Chinese. Um, I really felt like it was really heartwarming to see that his experience um, and his time at Stanford um, really got memorialized um, and really spread throughout the world. So uh, I, I'd have to say, number one is Dr. Hanbury because he started this program uh, and he was, uh, he was head of the program for over 25 years. Obviously, Dr. Han uh, Conley has to be a historical figure because her being the first uh, woman professor of neurosurgery uh, in the United States um, and uh, she really achieved a lot. The influence that she had over Stanford Hospital in general um, allowed the women that trained in the department to come through and and really have a lot more fair experience than than people had in other places. I never felt like I was was treated any different than than any other person. We are we're all just people and trainees, and we all got the same equal consideration. And that I think is Fran Conley's legacy. Dr. Steinberg for his 25 years of service as uh, chair of neurosurgery and also his program in treating patients with vascular disease. Uh, he's had the largest population of patients with Moya Moya disease. Dr. John Adler for what he did in terms of developing the uh, CyberKnife um, stereotactic radiosurgery, bringing that to Stanford and then developing this new tool and actually now a second tool with uh, the ZAP so uh, he, he has been quite an entrepreneur. Um, and now Mike Lim is our new chair. We also have something called the Hanbury Society, which is pretty unique. It's not every um, training program has it. That was formed by the uh, former residents. The way it works is the chief resident from 11 years prior has to host the meeting. He picks the venue and sets everything up. It's part scientific, part social. I am in the spine division. I have incredible partners. We all take care of our patients together when we need to. We're there for each other, which means that we have this collective sort of intellectual drive to make sure that patients are taken care of no matter what situation they're in or 
for uh, when they come to see us. And that culture is very deep, um, and I think it's a shared value that we all have. That transcends sort of, I think, any individual component of the department on its own. That deep culture helps steer the boat in the right direction, and I think ends up with really amazing basic science and clinical discoveries and outstanding care for our patients. As I reflect on this department, I'm just so impressed at how much our department has grown from a clinical perspective with research and with education. If you look at the clinical mission, we're providing outstanding patient care and it's reflected by the numbers of patients coming to our department. In addition, our residency has now grown from one a year to one of the largest residencies in the country. And if you look from what we're accomplishing with research, we are one of the highest NIH funded departments in the country. And we are producing papers almost on a monthly basis that are pub being published in some of the highest tier journals. I'm very proud of our department in the sense that we've truly been able to make an impact at many different levels.